Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Father, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes to comprehend, to feel, to be rooted and grounded in the steadfast love of the Lord. Father, we are not able to comprehend this without the gracious work of the Holy Spirit. So we ask for your gift and your grace and your presence that you would speak. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The year 2002, ABC launched a new reality TV show. Full confession, I have not actually watched one of these episodes, and neither will I ask you to raise your hand to give a confession whether you have either. But in 2002, the new reality show that was launched that has been incredibly successful in TV terms was The Bachelor. It's been running for 25 years, it's starting season 26 this month. If you're not familiar with this little slice of Americana, this is the basic plot of The Bachelor. A single bachelor is brought on the show and presented with a pool of single women. I think it's usually about 25 uh, women. And through the course of the show, that pool of eligible women is eliminated one by one with the hope that at the end of the season there is one remaining bachelorette and the bachelor will propose marriage to this bachelorette and they will live happily ever after. Uh, this has spun off all sorts of spinoffs. There's the Bachelorette Show, which is the same thing in reverse. Um, so of the 25 seasons of The Bachelor, of the show-ending proposals where The Bachelor proposes to the last remaining Bachelorette, only one of those proposals has actually resulted in a marriage that continues to this day. Two other times, The Bachelor actually ended up marrying the runner-up, and they're married, and they're still married to the rest of this day. But the rest of those seasons have not produced a lasting relationship. The Bachelorette has a little bit better track record of 18 seasons. I think four of those season-ending proposals are still married today. But all of that together, the elimination love game has about a 186 batting average. Not a real high success rate of producing lifelong love. Now, I understand this is a made-for-TV event I understand this is not reality, even though it's called reality TV. I understand that the producers introduce elements of conflict and all to make the story more, more enticing. I understand that many of the contestants are not really there to find true love. They are there to try to make a name for themselves. So I understand all of that. But I would submit to you that the success of that show is based and built upon some very real assumptions that we have in our heart and in our soul about love. I mean, think about it. This is a show where people are competing to earn the love and affection of one person. There's no real clear standard as to what you've got to do to do that. It's totally at the whim of The Bachelor, and we're, but we are competing to try to earn someone's love with the assumption that the vast majority of us are going to be rejected. 96% of us are not going to get the love. And even if you are the one at the end... The high possibility is that that love is not going to last. It will be lost. It will be temporary. I think there's something about that that we bring with us in our understanding or our presumption about God's love for us. I'm reading a book called Enjoying the Presence of God. It's written by Jan Johnson. She's a Professor, counselor, writer, author, all sorts of things. But in her book, she talks about how she was leading a support group for women who were struggling with eating disorders. And in the, the group session, she began to notice lots of comments about the ladies that were saying things that indicated they really doubted that God loved them or not. 
And so she decided we're just going to devote an entire session to prove and remind these ladies God loves you. And so she did that. She spent an entire session on that. And they just looked at her and said, we know God loves us. We don't, we don't doubt God loves us. Why are we wasting our time? We know this. So she said, okay. But then she noticed in the sessions that followed, she just began to hear statements like, God probably hates to hear me when I pray. Or God probably is mad at me for thinking this way. Or I'm not sure that God can even stand to look at me. Theoretically, they believed God loved them, but when they got into real life, that's when the doubts crept in. Or to put it into bachelorette language, God's love must be earned. The vast majority of us are not going to get it. And even if you are one of the few that might make it to the end and actually receive God's love, it is fleeting and you can lose it pretty quick. Now, none of us would admit that. None of us would share testimony time. Hi, I'm Todd. I don't think God loves me. But, but our heart, our soul, when real life crashes in, those thoughts begin to come out and leach out. I'm excited about our scriptures this morning from Isaiah chapter 43 because in Isaiah chapter 43, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God has an opportunity to express to you that He loves you, that you are precious in His eyes that he loves you. So if you would join me in Isaiah chapter 43, if you've got your copy of the Word of God, I hope you'll see it there. If not, the primary text is in your bulletin. But Isaiah 43 begins with the words, but now. And so before we read the rest of our text, we want to think about what the but now has been talking about. We've, if you're a guest with us today, we have been reading through Isaiah since September and we're going to be here for a little while later. We're working our way through Isaiah. And Isaiah the prophet is the prophet who has been speaking about the impending judgment of God. The impending judgment of God, which historically in Isaiah's day, day was God was going to give over his people, his city, Jerusalem, to the Babylonians in judgment. And Babylon is literally going to remove his people from Jerusalem. It's called the exile, when they're exiled from their land. And so Isaiah the prophet is speaking about this impending judgment that is coming. And the end of chapter 42 describes this. And 42 uses the language that God says, you've got ears but you're not hearing, you've got eyes but you're not seeing, and as a result of that you are winding up being captives and being imprisoned. And at the end of chapter 42 it says, who gave up Jacob to the looter, who gave Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? in whose ways they would not walk, and whose laws they would not obey. So God poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle, and it set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. This is speaking about the impending judgment of God and the judgment that fell. But Isaiah 43 begins with, but now. But now. Let's read these seven verses. We'll come back and make some comments. But now thus says the Lord. He created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes and you are honored and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Do you notice this section begins and ends with this emphasis that God created, God formed, God called, God chose them for his name. So he's saying, I'm, God is the creator of all things, but he's also looking at his people and saying, I'm the creator of you. I'm the one who gave you life, and I formed you as a nation. I called you to be a people of myself. I called you to enter into covenant with me. You belong to me. And then he says, for I have redeemed you. 
Isaiah here using what is often called the prophetic past. The prophetic past is speaking about God's work even in the future in such certain terms that you can use the past tense. But it's also prophetic past in the sense that it's looking back on God's redemptive work and looking forward on God's redemptive work. Because there is this sense in Scripture that we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. God has redeemed us in the past, God is redeeming us, and God will redeem us in the future. And so God says, fear not, I have redeemed you. And then he says, when you pass through the waters, when you pass through the rivers, when you pass through fire. If you read those like me, probably for the first time, you begin to think of some of the Bible stories that call to mind. When you pass through the waters, you think of coming out of Egypt and coming uh, crossing the Red Sea on dry land and how God was with them through the, the pillar of fire and the cloud and lead them through the that. You think about the waters, you think about Joshua leading the children of Israel into the promised land and crossing the Jordan River on dry ground. When you think about being in the fire, you may think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and not being burned, right? You think of all these stories, but, but the truth is, is that the scriptures, Isaiah and the Psalms, use the image of waters and rivers and fires to describe persecution, tribulation, trials, suffering, all manners of evils and strife that we go through. Psalm 66 says, We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. Psalm 69 begins by David saying, The waters are rising above my neck and I'm about to drown. It's this image of, of trials and sufferings and persecutions and says, When you walk through these, I will be with you. They will not overwhelm you. You will not be burnt. They shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. That's the word Moshiach. That's that Hebrew word that is translated in the New Testament as Christos, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. I am the Lord. I will be your Savior. I will give Egypt as a ransom. I will give men in exchange for you, foreshadowing the gospel, how God will send Jesus to be his Messiah, his Savior, and ransom for his people but notice the money quote there in verse 4, because you are precious in my eyes. You are honored. The word honored literally means to be weighty, to be heavy. You mean much to me. You, you are heavy to me. You are important to me. You are precious in my eyes. You are heavy. You are weighty. And I love you. Fear not, I am with you. I'll bring your offspring from the east to the west. The scattered people of God will come home. And then it ends again with everyone who is called by my name, everyone who is created for my glory, everyone who is I have formed and I have made. You know, it's interesting when you think about it. One of the things that we take for granted, one of the truths that we take for granted about God is that God loves. We have this assumption, we have this belief, we have this conviction that God's predisp predisposition towards humanity is a disposition of love and not hate. And it's because the Scriptures, this is the picture the Scriptures very clearly paint. This is why I wanted us to read 1 John chapter 4 to begin. Because God is love and God has demonstrated His love. It's interesting that John says God is love. He doesn't say God is loving, even though that is true. But he says God is love. This is who God is from the very beginning of time. It is the steadfast love of the Lord. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son Romans 5, God demonstrates His love towards us. Psalm 117, great is the steadfast love of the Lord forever and ever. And yet we believe that God loves us, and yet when real life hits in, we reveal that we really have a little bit more of a bachelor mentality deep within our souls than we want to admit. That God's love must be earned. That very few of us are going to fully and completely get it because we know we all fall short. And eventually, even if you do get it one day, you're going to mess up at some point. And God's love is going to fleet away. And to that, Isaiah 43 says, I love you. There's a lot we can say about the love of God for sure. We we'll spend the rest of our lives diving deep into that. But I hope that you'll hear three things this morning from Isaiah 43, and I put them in your bulletin notes if you want to follow along. But the first truth is just this God's discipline is not a sign that He has stopped loving us. God's discipline is not a sign 
that he has stopped loving us. This is, in fact, the very point of this passage. This is the but now of Isaiah 43. God saying that he has disciplined his people. In fact, the most extreme example that you can think of of God's judgment and discipline upon anyone in all of history really is the exile. I mean, I know you can think of Bible stories like Sodom and Gomorrah and fire falling down, and we can think of judgment stories, but really the most extreme example of, of that is the exile. God gave his people over to Babylon, and Babylon invaded the land and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and then carried the people away into slavery as prisoners of war to the city of Babylon, and they were there in exile for 70 years. I don't know why this was part of my Bible reading plan during the month of December, but I read through Lamentations, which is Jeremiah's first-hand account of the misery in Jerusalem, describing the starvation and the death and the misery of what it is like for God's judgment and wrath to fall in real time. It was the the worst example or the strongest example of God's discipline and anger and wrath really in all of human history. And these were people who deserved it. You read at the end of chapter 42, they have not walked in his ways. They didn't obey his law. God had invited them into a special covenant and they completely rejected it. You read the book of Kings and they practiced child sacrifice. They worshiped pagan gods. They completely deserved all of God's wrath and anger that he poured out upon them. And if there ever were a people that God should have said, I have had enough with you, or to use survivor language, I vote you off the island, or to bachelor language, I'm not giving you a rose. If there ever was a group of people that God should say, I do not want anything to do with you ever again, it should have been these people. And yet God says, you are precious in my eyes. You are honor you. I love you. And this is why it's so important to see why why God says that. He says, I created you before you existed. It was my love that created you. It was my love that formed you. It was my love that called you. I am the one that created you as a people group. And because of that, you are precious to me. New Testament in Proverbs, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12 quotes this verse from Proverbs chapter 3 that's in your bulletin. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves, a father in him who he delights. And so part of my prayer and hope this morning is if you are in a season of God's discipline where you, your sin is ever before you and God, is because of that, is in a season of discipline I hope that you will hear, that you will feel with your soul that that's not a testimony that God does not love you. It really is a testimony that God does love you. And you may not be in a season of discipline. Maybe you're in a season of some other kind of water or river or fire. Maybe it's just a season of suffering or trials or persecution or tribulations or testing. And those are the moments in our life that we mentally know that God loves us, but emotionally we we start to doubt. And may Isaiah 43, may you hear God say to you, you are precious in my eyes. I love you. Second truth I hope that you'll see out of Isaiah 43 is that God's love is not based upon our worth, but it's based upon who he is. It's based upon his eternal nature and character. See, part of our problem is, is I think that we without really thinking this through. I think that we assume God loves us the way that we love other people. And we tend to love other people because they have proven themselves to be lovable or worthy of our love. (laughs) Or we're stuck with them, you know, whatever it may be, right? We don't really want to, but we're stuck there or whatever. And so because of that, we kind of assume that's the way God loves us. But What Isaiah 43 reminds us is that God's love for us is not based upon whether or not we are worthy. It's based upon who He is. This was a group that 
they were not worthy of God's love at all. In fact, if you've read the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, you've gotten this flair, right? The people are not worthy of God's love at all, and yet God comes out with the statement, you are precious in my eyes, you are honored and I love you. You see, God's love for them is rooted in something greater than their worthiness of being loved. This is why it says, I created you. Before you even existed, my steadfast love, which is from time eternal, already was in motion creating you. Before you were ever formed, I am the one who formed you. Remember uh, Psalm 130, you were, I, God formed you in your mother's womb and already had the days of your life written out before one of them had come to be. Yet, because God had formed you, he already loved you and then he called you. I loved you before I called you. I loved you before I made you a people for my own possession. My love for you, God says, predates your worthiness or unworthiness. You are precious in my eyes. Again, 1 John 4, God is love. He's not just that he's loving, he is love. He is the essence of love. This is his character from eternal past to eternal future. He is love. He is the source of love. He is love. Psalm 103. Look at the distinction in Psalm 103. It's in your bulletin. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind passes over it. It's gone and its place knows it no more. In other words, there's no worthiness among humans. At best, the greatest thing that we do is just very temporal. In a fleeting moment, it just, it's gone. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's eternal nature is steadfast love. His eternal nature in the future is steadfast love. And that is the basis for His love for us. It's not about our worth. It's about who He is. Which leads us to point number three, which is that the cross should settle the question of God's love for us once for all. This is what uh, Romans 5 says, God demonstrates His love towards you and while you are still a sinner. While you are still unworthy of his love, God demonstrates his love for you, and in the midst of that, he sent his son. This is what John says in 1 John 4. This is love. God sent his son into the world. This is love that he sent his son to the propitiation for our sins. This is the demonstration of his love for us as God sent his son to bear our sins on the cross. I want to offer a parable to you this morning, and I hesitate to do this. I don't know how I can improve upon the gospel story, but Jesus told parables, so I guess I'd follow in his footsteps, okay? Imagine that I am a, a factory owner. I own a factory, several hundred employees. And just imagine, I, I am a good factory owner. I treat my employees well, I pay well, good benefits. It's a great place to, place to work. I am like the best factory owner in the history of humanity, okay? But there's a guy on my factory floor who's not content to just be another worker on the floor. In fact, he thinks that he should be running the place. He thinks that all the profits should be going to him. Basically, he wants to be the owner of the factory. He's not content. And so he begins to, you know, get other factory workers to join him, grumbling, discontent. We really should be making money. We should be running this place. You know, he starts doing that. Pretty soon there's sick outs and people calling in, not showing up for work. Equipment starts getting damaged, vandalism, factory starting to fall, fall apart. And as the owner of it, I see what's going on, and so I'm, you know, send the managers out to say, hey, you need to try to talk some sense into this guy and win him over. And none of that seems to work. It just seems to get worse, gets worse, and gets worse. And pretty soon, this rebellion is turning pretty much almost into an outright riot. I mean, there's, there's violence, they're, they're beating up the managers, there's destroying the property. I mean, the whole thing is about to just explode. And so I gather my, my uh, leadership around me and say, you know, I've, I've got a plan. And here's my plan to deal with this. I'm going to send my, my 21-year-old son. Now, for those of you who know me, I've got a 21-year-old son, and which would make sense of why this is a really bad plan. I will send my 21-year-old son, and he's going to go, and he's, he's going to talk some sense to him, and they'll listen to him. And the manager goes, that's a crazy plan. They're going to beat him up. They're, they're probably going to kill him. Look, there's a riot that's going on. I mean, they want to take over the factory. Here's the heir to the factory. It just makes sense. This is one step out of the way. It makes it easier for the taker. This is a horrible plan. And I'd say to you, yeah, but here's, here's the bigger plan. 
I know they're going to kill my son. But I will accept the death of my son as a, as a payment for all of their crimes and rebellion. All they've got to do is just to admit that they were part of this rebellion and believe that they really deserve punishment, but my son's death was in their place and come back to me. I'll forgive everything and we'll just have this great factory. And you would look at me and say, why would you do that? And I say to you, because these people in the factory are precious to me. I love them. I want to be reconciled with them. Which is why John says, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. See, this is what God has said to his people. I created you. Out of my love, I created you. I gave you the gift of life. Of course you're precious to me. I formed you. Everything from your physical body to your life, I formed it. I put it together. Of course you're precious to me. I called you. I called you in a relationship with me. Of course you're precious to me. I have Claimed you to be a people for my own possession. Of course you're precious to me. I love you. Which is why he says in verses 2. or Yeah, verses 2. Why do we believe that when we pass through the waters or the rivers or the fire that we won't be burned or overwhelmed? It's because we're precious to God. God says when, when you pass through the waters, I'm with you. Of course I'm with you. Because I love you. You're precious to me. When you walk through the rivers, I'm not going to let you be overwhelmed because you're precious to me. Why would I let that happen to you? When you walk through the fire, why would I let you be burned? You are precious to me. I love you. We get this picture of God's love for us. You know, the question really is, for us, about whether we will Walk in that love, or trust in that love, or rest in that love, or not. Because some of you in this room, you're walking through the waters. And you wonder, is, is God with me? You are walking through the rivers. And just like David said in the Psalms, I feel the water coming up to my neck. And you wonder, is God just going to let me drown? Or you're walking through the fire and you're wondering, is this just going to consume me? Will there be nothing left of me when this is done? And to hear God say to you, why would I let that happen? You are precious to me. I love you. The steadfast love of the Lord, while it is not something that we earn, and it's not something that we can lose, It is something that we can reject. It is something that we can just say, we we don't want anything to do with God's love. We don't want to believe God's love. We don't want to put our faith into God's love. There is that time that we have to come to in our life where we realize that we are sinners who are separated from God by our sin. And to receive what God has done for us by sending His Son on the cross to be the propitiation for our sin and to receive the forgiveness and to be reconciled with God. And perhaps you have never made that decision in your life. Perhaps you've always thought that God's angry at you. And this morning my prayer is that through the Holy Spirit that God has been able to convince you you are precious to Him. He created you. He formed you. He called you. He wants to be reconciled with you. But for many of us this morning, this is a reminder that as we walk through the water and the rivers and the fire, that we can trust in the Lord because we are precious to Him. He created us. He formed us. He called us. We are weighty to Him. And so this morning, it's about being rooted and grounded in His love. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And a lot of times we get to the end of this and it's time to get stuff together and get to Sunday school so we can go on. Let's not do that with this song. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak 
about the depth and the riches of God's love for you. Father God, we thank you for passages of Scripture like this, that in a different way, in a different coloring, in a different presentation that reminds us of the depth of your love. Father, much of my problem, and maybe someone else in this room, is that we know, as David said, our sin is ever before us. And we know that. We know we are unlovable, and so we wonder, why would you love me? Would you speak to our hearts this morning, and may we hear, you created us formed us, called us. And because of that, because of you, we are precious. And therefore that gives us the hope and the faith and the trust that when we walk through the waters and the rivers and the fires, you're there. Because we are precious to you. Father, would you continue to speak to us this morning? And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Let's stand together as we are standing and singing about God's love for us. I'll be down front if God's leading you to respond in some way to his scripture, to his word, to his love. I'll be here to receive you as we sing together.